Hi right, Adam, welcome to the show. I know you're super busy, mate. Um, it's great to have you with us. How's things? Yeah, all good, Peter. Thanks for having me, mate. Yeah, what have you been up to? Obviously, I know you, you're training loads of fighters now and doing bits and pieces. Yeah, I've been really busy with work. A um, lot of sessions going on and stuff. Um, I've done a couple this morning. Yeah, last time we was... Uh, well, not last time we see each other, but uh, last time we were very intimate was we were both in a ring together and uh, we boxed each other. I can't remember how long ago that was. I think it's got to be early 90s or 94, 93, something like that. Show my age. Show my age now. Crystal Palace Sports Centre. First, I'll start with, uh, how did you get into boxing, mate? Um, way I got into boxing, quite late. Um, same. Everyone says the same old stories. I don't want to sound like a bit of a donut, but got in a bit of trouble when I was young, getting a bit fighting and stuff, and ended up getting arrested um, for a fight at a party. And one of the charges was a fray, which I weren't even didn't know what it was, but I charged that. Yeah, yeah, solicitor said you a chance of prison with that one, which God, my bum fell out then, proper scared. And um, yeah, after it all got off of it anyway, got off. But then Dad said you got to do something, go down to the boxing gym, and I went to um, Kingston Boxing Club, Freddie Bars Club. Yeah, it was a good trainer, Freddie. Yeah, um, went to see Fred. How, about, how old? How old was you? I think 16, 17. Yeah, you started late then. Late, yeah, yeah. late, yeah. Yeah. What was um what was your first experience in the in the gym? I always remember because I went up to Fred and I went, I'm Peter Martin's boy. And my dad done a lot of boxing. He won the school boys and that. It was a good fight, my dad. Yeah. And Fred went, Oh, it's Peter Martin's boy. I think he thought because who my dad was, I was gonna be out of box, but I was useless, like yeah. no coordination, all that. Stuck me on a bag. And basically, yeah, I didn't have a clue. Yeah, he done one of them. Fred like, ain't you good at football? And I was like, yeah, because I was playing for Corinthian Castles. They weren't a bad team. Yeah. And he basically said, why don't you stick to the football? Yeah. Just do the boxing fitness. And I'm like, you know, I must be bad. Yeah. It? But, so I stayed there for a bit, but I wanted to compete, so I ended up going to the Foley. Yeah, and, it's a good club as well. Yeah, Foley was a bit old school. They basically let me box the next week. Yeah. Didn't miss about. Yeah, went on from there. Like getting into obviously you try like training. You started training amateur. Well. Let's f uh, finish off your career first. Um, obviously, <laughs> yeah, well, how many fights did you end up having? I had 90 odd, about 92, I think it was, between the Lodge and the Foley. Yeah. So I started off at the Foley. And then um, I always remember when I started boxing, my dad said to me, look, Ad, if you can win as many as you lose in the amateurs, you're doing well. It's hard, do you know what I mean, winning them all. But I won my first 10 or whatever, and I thought, you know, I'm going to win them all, me. Like. Yeah. But it didn't end up like that, obviously. But me, um, Trainer turned professional with Paul Miles. Yeah. He was a good fighter, Paul. Um, turned pro him and I didn't have a trainer. And I wanted to go to the lodge because my dad was there. So, yeah, ended up going up Fitzroy Lodge. The famous Mick Carney. Yeah. Uh, obviously, lost Mick Carney now. Yeah. But he was he was one of the old um, legends. He had some stories, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was brilliant. Yeah, Mick was brilliant. But he, um, what, any experiences of when you went away with the amateurs or? Yeah, he's had quite a lot of trips. Sort of um, boxing Germany, Spain. France, but the first trip I had was France. I went with a Foley. Yeah. I always remember it. It's, it was unbelievable, really. Like our coach driver got lost. Even he was a French geezer, so I don't yeah. know how he got lost. But he was driving around this <laughs> yeah. roundabout all the it time. It must be related to me. Yeah, he kept going around this roundabout. And when we got to the hall where the weighing was, because um, we were late, yeah. they basically weighed in, and there was a bit of paper with all their weights on it. Yeah, there was no French fighters there. Like, which ain't normal, is it? But yeah. we had a little kid. I can't remember his name, but he boxed for the Lion. Um, he was representing us. And his dad was like, my boy ain't boxing unless I see the other kid weigh in. Yeah. So next thing, they've brought him, the back door's open, and this French kid's come walking in, got on the scales, and like the trainer went, oh, he's eaten now. And, and then the old man went, what's he eating, a fucking horse? Like, <laughs> he was massive, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So like they all were. Like yeah. when, when I got in the ring, like this geezer weren't aware trying to stitch you up yeah they were all massive yeah. we've got stitched up out there do you know what I mean yeah but um, yeah I don't think anyone won out there there was about 20 odd of us out there Jesus it's unbelievable wasn't it yeah yeah so what happened what did you do after you, obviously after your boxing when you when it was coming to the end because obviously I know it's hard I've, you know I've been there myself found how hard it is you know when you retire what, what, what are you going to do you know I still ain't yeah. and that's my retirement yet but I think I think it's over for me now but um, what, 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 did, what did you think you wanted to do yeah, to be honest with you, I found it really hard and people don't really talk about it so much with the amateurs because yeah. they think it's just professionals who yeah. struggle when they yeah. stop. But to me, even though I was an amateur and I didn't turn professional enough, I didn't really think I was good enough to turn professional, but I boxed more like a pro. I trained every day. I never missed, I didn't go out. I probably lived a life. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. when it was 
I didn't stop until because of my age. Yeah. Because it, it was different. It's older now, isn't it? But it was 33 or whatever, the age limit. What did you do for work? I was a postman just yeah. because it fitted in with the boxing. Punching postman? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it kept you fixed. We had the bikes in and I used to finish early, shoot up the lodge because the lodge was a pro gym during the day. Yeah. Um, Dean Powell. So you sparred a lot of pros and all that yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, I used to love it. Yeah, like um, Colin Dunn, Michael Ayres, all some good fighters you spar yeah. out there. Why didn't you go pro? It's probably shit. I never. I had friends like do you remember Craig Stanley. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. And who were like, better fighters than me? Not being funny. And Paul Miles was a good fighter. And when they didn't Crack do it. great as pro, I thought you know what? It's an hard game that pro. And I couldn't. I weren't a big puncher, so I just thought it's not worth it. Stayed amateur. I mean, I loved the amateurs. I really did. You know what I mean? Yeah, and even was like, I wasn't a big puncher, but I went on yeah, to win three, yeah. three Irish titles. You know, we're not thinking about it? it now. Watching the pro scene now, because I'm at pro shows every week, and yeah. not being rude, like. Any man his dog can turn pro now, and they do, don't they? Yeah, and yeah. I look at that, and I think I would have done this different. It was different then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. I, I think back in them days, it was better. Like there was better fighters, and yeah. I think you know even the ABAs and things like that. You box three times in one night. That's yeah. unheard of. Now you box once in London. Now if you're lucky. Yeah, I remember. Do you remember when they done five twos for a little bit? Yeah, five twos. Yeah, yeah. So I boxed twice at Crystal Palace. I'd done ten twos. Yeah. I'd work at four o'clock in the morning because I was a postman. And I remember I, had, you know, all them rope burns all over me and all that. And, I was nagging. I remember my old man going, you might as well turn pro. I've just done 10 twos, like, you've got work at four in the morning, do you know what I mean? But yeah. So then, then obviously you went into the amateurs as a trainer? Yeah, um, sort of strapped, because I didn't know what to do, so I started at the Foley. I did enjoy it, but I always wanted a box, you know, that yeah. feeling, it was a bit of a weird feeling, really. Yeah. It's gone now, I don't get it now, but... Like, how how long was you in the amateurs for, training the amateurs? Well, a long time, I was at the Foley for a couple of seasons, and yeah. then... Um, Mick Carney offered me a job up the lodge, so I'd be all there, up there all day, you know. Yeah. But then I'd train the seniors in the evenings, so yeah. it worked out like that. And then when did you go with the pros? It was a weird story. I went to watch um, one of my fighters, Craig Wyatt, was yeah. a professional. I went to yeah. watch him box at the Camden Centre. He boxed a kid from Bogner, um, Jonathan Fry. And he didn't box very well. But in the last round, he did better. And I went and Craig, at least you listened to your corner and started yeah. boxing the last round. He went, hey, like, didn't, he, he, he couldn't really understand his corner I mean, a bit of a strange one but he basically said why don't you train me and I went I don't want to do the pros but I ended up doing it for Craig yeah um, yeah I weren't um, counting on getting more pros or nothing like that it just, just sort of happened so then um, obviously did you, your job changed as well changed your job or um, my job changed yeah because Mick offered me the job so I started doing that it was like youth work yeah. boxing sessions and stuff like that and then got on to mentoring and then started getting involved in more gang stuff I don't like calling it gang stuff because it's young people you know I'm a youth worker that's what yeah, I, do. I, bet that's, I bet that's good though isn't it? especially if you bring one of them out of you know it's someone that's in a bad place and you turn him around and he stops getting arrested and things like that yeah it's funny really because I first started there's a charity called Your Story they're still going now and they work with people kicked out of schools that sort of stuff yeah. and I've done a session for him boxing and he went oh you're really good with the young people you've got a good way about you do you fancy doing some mentoring and I went well I'm not qualified or nothing he went no I know you so I started doing this mentoring and you go and meet them one to one do some activities with them talk to them and all that but I didn't have a clue what I was doing like and yeah. but it sort of worked in a way but there was stuff that I'd done that you're not allowed to do do you know what I mean yeah yeah. I, I met this um, young person Peckham Peckham Rye, yeah. who was living with his nan, and when she asked her, she went, please help him. He's, he needs help like that. So I, I sat down with him. I was being all nice, like, what are you interested in? He said, I like cars. He was being a bit attitude and yeah. stuff like that. I went, oh, well, I've got access to um, mechanic courses. I can do motorbike. There was so much stuff you can get for these kids, you yeah. know what I mean? But everything I said, he'd like half mugged me off. Yeah. He's like, if I want a bike, I'll go and nick one and all that. It was just, it was hard work. Yeah. Weren't getting nowhere. Anyway, we went outside and I had a little one two five, a little like scrambler thing, Yamaha thing. And he said, Is that your bike? I went, Yeah. And he went, One phone call and that's gone. I, and I, just, <laughs> I lost me. Yeah. It's bad, really. Yeah. But I like, went, What'd you say? Like, he went, well, One phone call that's gone. I went, Yeah. And one punch, I'd knock all your teeth out, you little mug. I sort yeah. of lost my yeah, temper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I said, yeah. He's talking to me like that. I said, yeah. I ain't a youth worker. I'm a boxing coach. Little, like, and I proper lost it. And he was like, Easy, bruv, easy, and all that. I went, No, nah, not easy, mate. You're rude. Yeah. You want to learn some manners and all that. But I thought, Cool, I've lost that job. Do you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But then I got a phone call. So I arranged to meet him two days later. And the nan phoned me and she went, oh, Hi, Adam. It's um, 
good news and bad news. And I went, oh, what's the bad news? She went, oh, the bad news is he's not going to meet you. I figured that. I went, oh, well, what's the good news? She went, well, the good news is he said, I've got to ring you. He had, I've got to let you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, he was worried about you not, and he's never done that before. So I thought, well, at least yeah. I taught him a little bit of, yeah. Respect, I suppose. Did you it? did you ever did you ever hear from him again? No, nah, no, nah, never. No. Nah. He's doing twelve now. I've been told. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> what sort of what else are you doing? What other, other sort of stuff are you doing at the moment? Uh, like with the youth work, so I've um, run gangs projects. I've been lucky enough to run run them all over London. So I've I was in Tower Hamlets for a few years. I've done one in um, Tooting and Mitcham. Yeah. And now I'm based in Kennerton. And they call them gangs projects, but it's just anyone who's in, every young person's in danger of being involved in a gang or gang activities. Yeah. You know I mean, so I work with anyone, but. So, um, any funny stories like with, with the gang peep kids or? A few, few things like, um, when I was in Tower Hamlets, like Bethnal Green, I get these referrals from the prison service, like a company called Nacro. And yeah. when someone comes out, they put them placements, they want to yeah. do stuff. So. Big lad, right lump, come to see me, want to get involved. And I said, look, I'm just going out to do outreach. So outreach is when you walk around the estates, talk to young people and stuff like that, try and yeah. get them into your session. So you walk around me and I have a chat with you. So you walk around, so I see this young young Asian kid, all scars on his face and all that. And I was talking to him. I said, I'm looking for young people who want to do a bit of boxing. He went, do you want me to take you where the kids are now? I went, yeah, please. So he's riding along his bike, we're following him. And I was on his estate, we saw these kids outside the block of flats and um, yeah he started uh, it was funny like he started going as he's seen them he's going yeah come on then Bethlehem Green boys yeah I'm with my men like that so this geezer with me he's gone like is this outrage then I went no no it ain't I went oi what are you doing like that and he's like threatening them, trying to get them to have a, like, a punch up like that and I'm going no 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 like that and he's rode off on his bike but I went over and spoke to him but he was like a rival with him, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Trying to stitch Taste it up. up yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you had something on, uh, happened, was it on a football pitch? Yeah, I, I've had quite a lot of things, you know what I mean? But um, I had a football team playing a um, football tournament at Elmer's End. It was run by Crystal Palace yeah. community. Yeah. Thing, and um, our team weren't playing. It was like a five-a-side competition. And there was, um, I was watching these other kids playing. Someone fouled someone. But then they squared up. But one of them said something about, I'm going to shank you, like stab you. Yeah. Like so when he come off, the other one was on his phone. And I was watching and I went over to the guy in charge. The thing is, they're so young, some of these people yeah. running the tournament. You know I, mean? I, was, I was sitting, look, what's just happened? The other one's on his phone, I think. And he went, oh, you know what the kids are like. So I went, oh, I'm just letting you know. And anyway, about an hour later, it was a boiling hot day. They stood out like sore thumbs. They all walked in big... Uh, hats, hoods up, massive coach, you know what I mean? And I watched them. They walked over to this young fella and they walked him out. He didn't struggle, or he just walked out of them. So I went back up to the palace fella and I went, look, that's them kids. I think he's taking them out. And he went, like, if they take them off the premises, there's nothing we can do. Yeah. And I went, well, well, I ain't leaving him on his own. So I went out there. They was all round him. And uh, it was funny because the fella spoke to me the way I thought I should have spoke to him. He spoke yeah. to him like I was a kid. I went, oi, mate, what are you doing like that? And he put his hand up and he went, I'll tell you what's happening here today. Yeah, He's disrespected a member of my family and now he's got to explain his actions and see what consequences. He spoke to me like that as if yeah. he was like a lawyer or something. <laughs> so I, I was like, all right. And I went, no, no, hold on a minute, mate. You don't understand. You are not hurting this kid. Yeah. I will not let you hurt this kid. But it was more of them coming. It was weird. It was like saying out of a film. There was one on roller skates. It was coming from everywhere. Yeah. He's obviously phoned them, do you know what I mean? They've all come to look after him. But I was, no one was listening to me. I weren't getting nowhere. And um, I was looking around, thinking what I was doing. I clocked, there was this kid there, big afro, and I could just tell he didn't want to be there. And I went, mate, what's this about? Like, he went, tell me about it. He said, I don't want to be here. He said, I'm not even from these ends. And I went, where are you from? And he went, around Lewisham Way. I went, oh, I've got friends around here. Like that. And, I went, Javan Young, he was one of the boxers at the lodge, and I knew yeah. he was an handful when he was younger and stuff. Yeah. So I put his name in, and he went, oh, you know Javan? I went, yeah, of course I do. I see he's in Miami at the moment. Yeah. Javan turned professional out in Miami. Anyway, he called the one who was sort of in charge, and he went, yo, yo, he knows Javan, like that. And he went, you know Javan? I went, yeah, and I'll tell you what, if Javan knew what you was doing now, he'd think you're a right dick, mate, because you're yeah. being a bully. Yeah. Like that. And he went... He went, bruv, I don't want to be here. Do you think I want to be here? He said, yeah. this ain't something I want to be doing. 
I went, well, what do you want to be doing? And he went, well, I want to try and get out of this shit and all that. I want to be a fitness trainer and all that. And I started talking to him, got his number. They give the kid a swerve. Not because of me, because of Javan, you yeah. know what I mean? Give the kid a swerve, walked off. Basically told him to be careful, like one of them, but walked off and left him. And then the kid phoned me the next week. I didn't really expect him to ring me, but he rang me the next week. And we got him on a gym course. Yeah. Sorted him out a bit. But. So, I mean, obviously all this is going on at the moment with kids with knives and bits and pieces. Obviously, you're trying to help out. What what, what do you think can be done to... to obviously, it ain't ever going to stop, but yeah. can be helped. Anything else that can be helped? Any, you know? It's just... The, well, it sounds obvious, but the more activities, the more... You know, like youth clubs are shutting. There's nothing for these kids to do, is it? Like... The lads I'm working with at the moment in Kennerton, a lot of people moan because they're just hanging around on the slate. I was like, give them something to do, isn't it? Yeah. I get, when I'm there, I get them in boxing, I get them playing football. And they do it, they take part, but if there's nothing for them, they're just going to hang up out. Yeah. But um, obviously, uh, I heard about you a little while ago. Um, you had a bit of a bad time. Well, you've had a few bad times. Um, <laughs> first, I want to touch on um, obviously, uh, you've been diagnosed with cancer. Um, you know, it, it's a lot of us well it's most people you know one in two now they say you get it um, how did you deal with that? to be honest it was always it was like I was in denial like I never really because I didn't feel ill really yeah. I, I went to I, I had a change in my testicles like yeah. so I went to the doctor told him so you did a, grow up here in the end yeah just <laughs> <laughs> he had a little feel, feel about and all that and he, what did he give me first? Like some anti-inflammatories or something sent me away and then I weren't happy about it and I went back a week later or whatever, he gave me antibiotics. But then I was at a boxing show at Tower Bridge at the City Grange Hotel, yeah. um, like a charity thing, and my stomach was just, it weren't right. I mean, it weren't normal yeah. stomach ache. And I told my wife and she went, right, I'm getting you up to the hospital. And they basically diagnosed me there. But well, they, they can't diagnose you, but they told me what they thought it was. Yeah. Um, so yeah, then I got put on that like cancer list where they do it really quick. They see you really uh, quick as the operation, had it removed. Yeah, it's scary though because um, me and my wife sat with a surgeon before the operation, and he he said, "Can I just say you well done for getting it early? Yeah, this kind of tumor you could have been dead by Christmas." He went like, Jeez, "Yeah." Oh, oh, my wife's all upset. Yeah, bit, and oh, thanks, mate. But I suppose they're just. Yeah, for well yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What what treatment did you have for that? I was I was lucky really. I had um one lot of chemotherapy. Yeah. And then um I've been all clear. Yeah. How, how did you feel now. mentally with that though? Was it how did you get through it mentally? Um it it helps with the, like my wife's brilliant then. She didn't let me go to one appointment on my own and that's always with me. So yeah. and I had to support all my family, so it's brilliant. That's, so that's but, great um, support. I just had a bit of it was just sort of run a bad luck, you know what I mean? And then um I can't, this thing on my tongue and it wouldn't go. Yeah. We were meant to be going out that night, uh, someone's birthday, and I went to the walking clinic and she said, oh, I've got this thing. And she looked at me she went, whoa. That's what she said. She went, whoa, yeah. that could be cancer. That's a lump. You yeah. have to go to a proper hospital. Like, I can't yeah. tell you. I thought, oh, not again. I said, how yeah. bad luck can you have? What year was that in? Was that a year? Last was that year, same year. Like last year, yeah. But what year did you have the cancer? Was it last year? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Last year. So you yeah. had last year the cancer. And then the mouth thing, yeah. like, like a month after mid thing, like it weren't long. So then obviously you thought 2019 is going to be a great year. Yeah. And what happened in 2019? You had another accident, didn't you? Yeah, I got knocked off my motorbike. <laughs> 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 on the A3, but some guy, he got nicked. Like, it was his fault, he just drove into me. <laughs> yeah. I went flying, mate. I'll say, I thought it's the weirdest feeling. It was like slow motion. I was flying through the air and I thought, well, you I could, like I slow see, man? all I could see was white. Like, and I thought, I'm going to land in a minute. Like, and I, yeah. Then I went, bosh, on this. Like obviously motor in front but then yeah. I was flying again I thought what's going on now like? and then I landed on, on the one behind sort of thing you weren't smoking nothing was you no no <laughs> then I got up climbed over the barrier because I was worried about getting running over and then sort of collapsed <laughs> in someone's front garden <laughs> because it was round the corner from my house a car went past and spotted me and yeah. she stopped she went do you want me to get your wife and I went yeah but she kind of she went what the fuck have you done now she went right well, didn't ring an ambulance yeah the ambulance they rang the ambulance yeah oh, yeah. yeah ambulance come but so, and they broke my fingers like Broke my little finger. Jesus. I was lucky, like, yeah. I went flying, but I don't want another bite now. I ain't even had one since. So what's what's the plans going forward? No, obviously you ain't got no more bikes and how'd you get to work now then? Oh, on the train. Oh, it's a bit stressful, that one. Yeah. So there's a lot of travelling and 
Yeah, I need, I'm luckily I'm based at Kennerton all the time now, so I just go from Toll to Vauxhall every day. So it's not the end of the world, you know what I mean? But they're always delayed or something. So what's your plans in the future? To get a world champion and... Yeah, I've, I've recently handed him a notice in at work, which... Yeah. Um, I hope they know because this is going to go out of No, nah, they know, yeah, they know. Yeah. Um, my last day's in the September. Yeah. I bet you'd be gutted though, not working with them kids and... Oh, you know what? I'll always keep... Like every um, project I've worked on, I've always kept it. Like the Hackney one, I've got friends from Hackney. Um, I mean, people at my wedding come from the Mitchum one, you know what I mean? I've always... Yeah kept in touch with them and what they, did you say to everyone keep your handbag safe because it could be a bit trouble here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah be careful yeah, yeah. so like, yeah yeah, you'll, stay, you'll still stay in touch and will you still do bits and pieces with them or yeah yeah if I can yeah yeah just a bit of charity sort of charity yeah, yeah. work or something like that and like yeah definitely always always there for them do you know what I mean and I'll keep in touch with them anyway Adam you know when you went to the doctors and they and, you know they said about your tongue I mean I'm not being funny you've gone into a walking clinic yeah, yeah. they've turned around and said you've got a lump whoa 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 this could be cancer I mean yeah. what did you what, when you went back to the hospital what did they do did they just say it's a lump on your tongue nah so I went um, Kingston to the oral clinic and uh, Coy they take a biopsy off your tongue they cut it off yeah I can off I'm not being funny that was nasty like but they cut it off I think I had two cut off, but then they, the surgeon, he was, you know, they're always a bit eccentric and stuff like that. Yeah. So good, good at his job and stuff, but he was like, it's like taking pieces out of a birthday cake just because that piece didn't have cancer in it. Don't yeah. mean this piece ain't going to, I'm going to yeah. take one bigger piece. So he took like, took quite a large lump off the last time, but thank God it was um, not cancer, which was good. I mean, me. at that point, I mean, how was you feeling? Obviously after beating cancer once and as they say, you know, after five years, they get the clear, they're all clear, and they reckon people then yeah, uh, yeah. hopefully they don't get it. But obviously, second time getting it, you must have thought, you know, what's going on here? Yeah, I was just like, praying, really. I thought, it can't be, I can't have that much bad luck. Thank God I didn't. Yeah. Um, just, yeah. Yeah, on the motorbike, you know, obviously when you fell off the motorbike, you know, you must, you know, you, you were sitting there. You must, what, what lesson did you learn from that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank God I'm over, by the way. <laughs> I was feeling on bad luck. I don't know. Like, mind you, I've had a bike for years, like nothing like that. Yeah. But, but it, obviously, it's someone else, isn't it? It's another, it's another, an idiot on the road that's knocked you off the bike. Yeah, yeah, it don't matter. But you must have sat up and thought, I've got to change something here in my life. Yeah, it's like, so everyone's <laughs> saying, like, you must have like an angel looking out for you and all yeah. that. And maybe I have, haven't it? Must be a dodgy angel, though, because it, it lets you do a bit of it, doesn't it? Yeah, three times, like, yeah. I mean, um, you know, with like the kids, uh, you know, you work with at the schools and what, what the kid, the, you know, the naughty kids as you call them. Yeah, you call them that, I think. Yeah, oh, I, a little bit naughty. Listen, I've been naughty myself. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I know. You know, I've had my, I've, had, you know, I've learned a lot from going to jail, and you know, I've learned a lot in my life. But yeah. um, what have you learned from? What what have, what are they learning from what you're telling them? You should, I'll be honest, with you, I've worked with some of what the so-called worst kids. Like, yeah. I hear these stories about them. When I actually work with them, I'm like, they're not even that bad. These kids, you know what I mean? Yeah. Some of them, it can be a breakdown in a family or whatever, but once you start giving these kids, you know, a bit, a bit of good feedback, something positive. Attention, attention, yeah, something yeah. positive, like, let them know they can do stuff, they can achieve stuff. You watch them change, like, these kids ain't getting nothing positive. They get kicked out of school, yeah. so I work in a lot of the pupil referral units and stuff like Been that. Been told they can't, you know, yeah, you're, not, you're not going to amount to nothing. They and... just think they're rubbish and stuff, but then, just because they're not good at schoolwork, don't mean they're not good at nothing else, you know what I mean? And, do you think they should set up centres then for kids, you know, like who who don't like school? Yeah, well, there basically. are there are centres, but you basically have to get kicked out one to get put in it, and then you get this you're on, the, on your situation way down, you? where it's more like some of them are like a little prison sort of thing. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Where you get all the bad kids in one place, but they're not bad kids, mate. When you work with them, you just got to give them some. You know, yeah, I think a lot of kids just need their arm around them and say, look, you're doing well. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, and I think that's a big thing. Yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, this is a bit of a awkward question. Um, I find it hard to understand myself. And I've got my own two little girls. Um, what advice would you give to people to understand, you know, the young people of today? Especially the kids you work with. And I'm not singling them kids out, no, but no. other people single them kids out, you know? Yeah, I mean, you've got to speak. I see so many people... Just walk past these kids, look at the floor, don't want to talk. You've got to talk to these kids, you know what I mean? These kids are speech. A lot of the ones I work with, they're so um, strong about their community. They look after their community, you know what I mean? Look out for each other. And I think people just need to listen to them. 
and speak to them. I got an example. I was working in a pupil referral unit, and um, it shared with a leisure centre. And there was um, a guy in there who used to shout to him, have conversations with himself in the mirror, shouting. But he was a bit scary. He was like a yardy guy, talking mm. about knives and all that. He was quite a scary fella. And, and all the kids were scared of him. You know what? And every day he was in the change room shouting. I thought, oh, well, I can't. I so went, how you going, mate? Like that. You know what? I had a normal conversation with this fella, like a proper normal conversation. And he was like, um, I can't sleep at night and all that. And we just spoke, normal as anything. Yeah. And then as soon as we finished talking, he went off, he started shouting again. But he's got a form of um, schizophrenia. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like, when we was walking down with the kids down the corridor, one of them who weren't there went, oh, there's that nutty one down there like that. And one of the other kids went, he ain't nutty. Sir, talking to me, call me sir. But sir talks to him. Like that, he's normal. He's just got like a few problems like that. And I thought well, they've learned. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like not to judge people and never judge a book by its cover. Yeah, sort of thing. and talk to people. Yeah, definitely. So your advice would be, well, maybe <laughs> Jesus, what does go just, around talking to nutters? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, so your advice would be just to maybe sometimes reach out to people and listen to what young people are saying, hear them, like talk to them. Yeah. I mean, the generations is skipped. It's skipped one generation, and it? it's, it's the generation of today is not like our generation. Without a doubt, no. I mean, my dad says it used to say it to me when I was young. Like, you know, you're not the same as what we was, but it is. It's the same now with the next generation to a degree, isn't it? Yeah, to yeah. us. Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard for these kids. Now. I wouldn't want to be one of these kids growing up. Can't go to certain areas. Yeah. postcode things and all that. Yeah, it's you can't. You can't buy a house. Yeah. It's hard to buy a house. Yeah. You know, get yourself on the ladder. You know, it's hard to get jobs if you ain't got an education. Yeah. You know, it, it is hard. But um, so you reckon that's the way to sort of go forward? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Well, as you know, Ad, a uh, podcast called Journeyman. Obviously, I set this up to spread the word. Just if we, even if we help one person, help one person, right? What is your biggest uh, thing you learned from obviously having cancer, um, nearly having cancer the second time? falling off your motorbike you know that's three near death experiences how, you know how, what, what is the thing you can give to people out of this podcast that will help them in life to be honest I've always gone through life doing everything for everyone else never really doing nothing for myself and that's why I'm changing stuff to follow my dreams come on goals make everything better for me and for my family and not just do the safe I was always doing what was safe just to pay the mortgage and stuff but I want better than that, better than that for me. So you've realised now in life that uh, there's yeah. more to life than just doing that? Life's too short. Go follow your goals, go for it. And uh, your your advice to um, any kids that are out there at the moment that are causing trouble and, do you know what I mean? Is there any places for them to reach to or? Yeah, get down your local boxing club. Yeah, Boxing clubs everywhere. Every area there's a boxing club. Isn't what about girls? Yeah, and girls now, isn't it? But yeah, yeah. Or do so, something. Yeah. It doesn't have to be boxing, does it? It can be anything. Yeah, something yeah. that gets you off the streets gets you active something that you enjoy do you know what I mean get a hobby get some friends that are out of gangs yeah you know I, mean? I try with my kids you know um, to keep them off social media obviously my youngest ain't on social media my eldest is um, what do you think about social media and things like that do you think it should be limited time on social media yeah I, you know what I don't really know social media changed it I thought I was up with all the social media but the young people I work with tell me I'm old they don't use Facebook anymore and all that and we're using Snapchat now and all that they tell me but yeah but I don't know you still got BB, BB Messenger in you <laughs> <laughs> i Blackberry yeah. Yeah, yeah but my little boy uh, Rocco he was playing Fortnite for a bit but we banned him from playing that like yeah. it just takes over your life like all that stuff isn't it yeah yeah but Peter so what I've been through I'd say you've been through as bad or worse you know what I mean big operation and stuff like that What's changing for you? What's it done for you? Um, again, it's to sit up and think uh, what you've got in life, the people you've got around you, the people you want around you. Um, I think it's uh, it's the same sort. Well, it's not. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's it's crazy. It's been a whirlwind for me. You know, obviously losing my brother four days after I, you know, I come out of hospital. Um, it's probably more to see my family, my dad, because people don't last forever, yeah. you know? And uh, my message to people are is, um, 
again, just enjoy it while you're here. Just enjoy life while you're here. Um, I just want to move on there. Be positive. Set this podcast up, you know, hopefully that we can spread the word. I can help other people, you know, in, in any, like all different ways of life. This ain't, although this is a boxing podcast and I'll, you know, I'll have boxers on it, but I'll have all different kinds of people on it because what I want to do is spread the word in everything, cancer, bullying, uh, every, everything, you know, I, everyone does spread words, but I want to spread it in everything and make it a bigger, bigger outset. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, and, and try and everyone learn a lesson off every person I get on the podcast. And that's my, uh, claim for the future. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So obviously Adam, you're a pro trainer. Um, how do you see the Joshua Ruiz rematch? Uh, I expect Joshua to have learned from the first one. Yeah. Um, he weren't right everyone can see he weren't right and boxed a, a plan and boxed through his ears off like do you know what I mean use his skill yeah but how many how many rematches um, have actually people beat them and rematch it in big rematches there's not many is there yeah I, I know what you're saying and is six months going to have changed that I'm not saying he said give me like that Josh is going to do it but I know he's capable of doing it yeah um and I hope he does do it. I like Joshua, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but is is, is that your, your prediction and you're going with Joshua on points? Yeah, yeah. Or or even a stoppage. I think, I don't know how, Ruiz is obviously going to be even more confident. He's going to think he can walk through him this time and yeah. so in Joshua uses his brain, boxes the right fight. And I think Styles make fights and I think Ruiz beats him again. Um, but anyway, Adam, it's nice to have you here and, um, a great work you're doing with the uh, community and uh, I'm glad you're going to go on to do what you want to do in the future and um, listen all the best in the future health to you and your family and kids thanks for coming to see us and you Peter thanks cheers. very much mate thanks so. mate cheers yeah cheers mate